Hello and welcome to Socialism, the weekly Marxist podcast from the Socialist Party. The London Mayor and Assembly are up for election in May. The Labour Party, Sadiq Khan, is the incumbent and Labour's candidate for 2020, but is a supporter of the pro-big business wing of Labour and an opponent of Jeremy Corbyn's anti-austerity politics. Low pay, a housing crisis, disappearing council services, knife crime and air pollution are all major issues in Britain's capital. Khan has presided over their continuation. So how should trade unionists and socialists approach the London elections? How would a socialist greater London authority behave? And what could a campaign raising those ideas achieve, whether or not it was elected? This episode of Socialism looks at the London elections. Socialists into City Hall. We're here today with Nancy Taff, who is the chair of the Save Our Square campaign in Waltham Forest and a member of the London Socialist Party Regional Committee. Hello, Nancy. Hello, James. And also with Paula Mitchell, who is the London Regional Secretary of the Socialist Party and a member of the party's executive committee. Hello, Paula. Hello. So we're going to be talking today about the electoral campaign for London Mayor, which is coming up. When is that coming up? 7th of May. 7th of That's May is polling day. Yeah. <laughs> and the London Assembly. And the London Assembly as well. Why should Sadiq Khan, who is a Blairite Labour politician and the incumbent Mayor of London, be given a free run in this election? Should he be left to carry out pro big business policies without a challenge simply because he's a Labour candidate? Who is going to fight for the anti austerity platform represented by Jeremy Corbyn, among others? in the recent period, in the coming election in London? We are. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that's the main point, isn't it? That there was a despondency, if you like, after the election of the possibility of Corbyn's manifesto disappearing. Because contrary to what lots of people you know, are told on the television, in the radio, etc., We in the Socialist Party believe that that manifesto was popular, that socialist Mm. policies are popular. And it's the Blairites inside the Labour Party, including Sadiq Khan, who have undermined those ideas for about four years. And part of this challenge on City Hall, if you like, a socialist challenge on City Hall, is saying to people that we need to fight for those socialist parties around housing, around young people, around transport, etc. And if Starmer gets elected and Sadiq Khan is in City Hall, then we're just going to have what we had before Corbyn came along, which is just unacceptable and unbearable. Hmm. No, that's right, because I think when you look at what happened in the general election and how lots of people who'd voted for Labour for years stop voting Labour this time, it's because of the conditions of life that they face, this huge housing crisis, cuts to their local services, cuts to jobs and so on. Mm. And that's the reality of life for people in London as well. There's a huge housing crisis and people really struggle on low pay with the high cost of living in London and you know, there's so many other issues that people face, like young people and the knife crime and all of that. And Sadiq Khan looks like he wants to make friends with the billionaires and the property developers and isn't doing anything for working class people. And that's a real risk. And unless it's fought for, unless there's a political challenge, then there's a real risk there of the disillusion of loads of people that, you know, no one's going to speak for. And can I just say, there is this assumption that the dynamic you've seen in Scotland or in the north of England... Or the just Midlands. or the Midlands just doesn't exist in London. Mm. This idea that the Labour controlled councils can just do anything to people, uh, the Labour politicians in London, the new Labour politicians, the Blairite politicians, can just do anything to people, and this won't create a confusion mm. and a sort of a disorientation on the basis that working class people across London will come to see no difference in the political establishment. And I think that there's an arrogance there. I mean, I was at a meeting last mm. night in Leighton, in East London, where a new Labour councillor 
basically facing a hundred people who were all expressing anger at this regeneration project which was given land to the property companies he just wasn't listening to the room <laughs> and that that feeling that you're not listening to us that services are going life is becoming very fraught that feeling is palpable at street level in london mm. Mm. Last week I was at a meeting organised by the RMT in London, the Rail Union, mm -hmm. which organises, you know, station staff and drivers and so on on the tube. And they've just announced that they're balloting for action across all the tube workers in their union over pay mm -hmm. and over their working conditions. We've got a Labour mayor. Why are they having to go on strike, potentially, to fight just to be treated with decency, just mm -hmm. to have pay that they can live on and they're not the only group of workers who are finding themselves having to go into confrontation bus drivers are another one mm -hmm. because of appalling working conditions Sadiq Khan's their boss mm -hmm. you know if he was a, an actual a socialist mayor he'd sort all that out they wouldn't have to be going on strike so that's an interesting question then actually as you say the RMT is balloting on pay and working hours it's a billion pounds of cuts to transport for London actually mm. which Sadiq Khan's authority is going to be presiding over this Labour mayor Unite is the trade union organising those bus drivers they had a big regional strike in London a few years ago there could be another one coming down the line against mm. Sadiq Khan this Labour mayor who as part of his campaign made a big deal out of being the son of a bus driver mm. yes, and in fact yeah. was a pro privatisation transport minister under Tony Blair in the past what should these trade unionists and others in London for example education workers members of the National Education Union mm. campaigning against academisation mm. which Labour councils have a certain amount of power to intervene in. What should all of these trade unionists say and do about the London elections, do we think? Well, they shouldn't give a blank cheque to Sadiq Khan. The trade union fight around pay and conditions is something that the trade unions obviously are involved in on a sort of day-to-day -day basis. But historically, the Labour Party was sympathetic at least at certain times in our history, to work a struggle. Now, Sadiq Khan, we can't even say for definite whether Sadiq Khan will not use anti-trade union mm. legislation That's against true. these workers. The reason we can say that is because recently he's made noises about not wanting to tax Google and Facebook based here. He's made noises about wanting more billionaires in London. He made noises after the Brexit vote, that he wanted London to be in a sort of region of its own, going off back into Europe. So he's on the side of big business. He's not attached to the Labour movement. And so the bus drivers that will be struggling over conditions and pay and the tube workers, he's not their friend. He's never been their friend mm. and he's not going to be their friend. And that's why a socialist challenge would be, if you like, the political voice of these struggles. So there's been a kind of strike wave in progress, actually nationally, on a small scale, but potentially in London as well. Trade unionists will be asking whose side is Khan on. He says he's going to stand up for Londoners. Is this the case? And what would a socialist mayor do about these trade union disputes instead? Well, I think, first of all, a socialist mayor or, you know, socialists in City Hall would be supportive of trade unionists fighting for decent pay and decent working conditions. But also we'd be part of a campaign, a political mm, right. campaign allied to you know, this industrial wave to demand more money for London. Mm. You know, we often are around this city, we walk around this city and we see Canary Wharf, we see the towers of finance, we see all the money, and yet public services are not given any of that money in London. And so therefore, we would support politically those struggles, and we would also link up with mm. those struggles to demand, you know, like they did in Liverpool. Mm. In the that, 80s. In the 80s, for more money. In the 80s, there were movements all around the country. I mean, Liverpool was the most successful. They were the ones that linked up the public sector workers, the workers in the city, 
with the fighting socialist council and they allied together and they won more money and we would base ourselves on that tradition mm. that's right that's the example we draw on isn't it which is so liverpool city council was a socialist led council that's our party's history and we draw on that ourselves for london and transport is a prime example of that there's this billion pounds of cut to transport for london mm-hmm. which is affects tube workers it affects the buses it affects the other aspects of transport in London as well, and rivers and all of that as well. And obviously that comes from the Department of Transport. That's because they've stopped the subsidy. And that's absolutely linked to why transport workers are potentially preparing for strike action, strike action over pay and working conditions. But that's linked to the crisis of funding and cuts that will be coming down the line. And it's not just that we're saying Sadiq Khan should be supporting them in their struggle. He should be leading a struggle. He should be refusing to implement those cuts. A socialist mayor would make a stand and would appeal to all those RMT members and Unite members on the buses and so on to launch a massive campaign which would then, you know, appeal to the travelling public in London, which is millions of people a day. I can't remember Mm. the actual figure, but it's huge numbers of people Mm. that use it and themselves you know are, are squashed into yeah. hot buses and and, and and all the rest of it yes no exactly you could have a massive campaign based around a leadership coming from a socialist mayor from socialist and city hall the leaderships of those fighting trade unions in london city hall has the beauty of being across the river from parliament yeah. it's a direct challenge yeah. to the tories in power And even if having this debate now about the London elections puts that on the table, if all we achieve is we have that debate about what's necessary, then I think we're achieving something. Mm. So it would be an opportunity for these industrial disputes and presumably other campaigns, which we'll come on to discuss in a moment, to raise some of their demands and get a bit more profile in the course of the hustings and debates around who is going to be in the Assembly and in the Mayor's office after the election. Mm. Now, you mentioned that it would not simply be a question of supporting these campaigns, but also being a part of them, helping to lead them, having a political strategy to get funding for them, mobilising for them. This sounds like it's actually going a bit further than Jeremy Corbyn's anti-austerity platform and starting to involve the working class and its organisations in really fighting for these sorts of changes. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's already... You know, obviously the trade unions exist in London and as Paula has said that they're getting organised to campaign around pay and conditions. But there's a myriad of different community organisations that are springing up to fight regeneration programmes that are skewed in favour of property developers that are compounding the housing crisis. There's community campaigns of parents against knife crime, the closure of youth clubs. Last night at the meeting I was at the issue of the cut to a particular bus route. There's a little campaign around that. Mm. So there's loads Mm. of different campaigns and trade union organisations that could be married together in one force to demand and lead a campaign for more money for London, Mm. to defy the government settlement. And that's what we haven't got. And Mm. that's because Sadiq Khan doesn't believe in that. And Mm. the thing is, is that the Labour Party's nominations for the GLA Assembly... So that's the Greater London Authority. Yeah, they all went to anti-Corbyn people. Mm. They all went to predominantly new Labour people, people who don't agree with Corbyn's manifesto. So they're basically going to be agreeing with this cascading of further neoliberalism across London both in the schools, on the transport, etc. So I think there is the possibility for the London elections to unify behind them different campaigns, different trade union organisations and be part of continuing the fight for socialist ideas in London that we don't accept that the light's been snuffed out, that they're logical, they answer lots of problems and that socialist into City Hall is about continuing that fight Mm. and it's already continuing I mean as soon as the election was over there's like you say this little mini strike wave Mm. there's almost Mm. as if people have thought right we've got to take control of the politics Mm -hmm. they are 
mm. taking control, if you like, and not mm. giving it to politicians who are promising them in four years. There's an impatience at street level, which I think our campaign of Socialists into City Hall could marry those different forces together mm. with an aim of you know, pushing the campaign forward, pushing these ideas forward. Mm. And I think we probably should say at this point that we're not only thinking about London, but if there was a fight like that in London, mm. that could have a big effect elsewhere as well. We'd reach out to councils and campaigns and, and struggles, you know, nationally. But if there was a fight like that in London, it could be the beginning, you know, it could spearhead a national campaign. And we do know, we've heard of reports of ones and twos here and there of councillors who are feeling the pressure and recognising and saying, I can't do this any longer. If there was a real fight here, then that could reach out nationally and you know and, and lead to a national campaign. And we'd obviously be mounting the call on the Labour councils, on the Labour leadership candidates now, that that's what they should say, that they should say that the Labour councils all over the country should take a stand and refuse to make these cuts and fight for the money that the Tories have stolen off us for the last 10 years. So we see our campaign in London as, you know, in that wider context, you know, a campaign here could have a wider effect. And so this would involve using reserves and borrowing powers, and we've explained in previous podcasts how it's possible yeah. for local councils to establish no-cuts budgets which can actually provide for the needs of local communities yeah. and use that to build a campaign to win the funding back from That's central right. government. And that applies to the Greater London Authority as well. The Greater London Authority is made up of the Mayor and the Assembly, and the Mayor has a budget of, I think it's about £19 billion. <laughs> it's not a tiny amount of money powers on housing and so on, but also has borrowing powers, the same as councils do. So all the demands that we've raised about what councils should do, that applies to the London Assembly and the Mayor as well. And there are, of course, these noises, like you say, from some parts of the country, like the right-wing Liverpool Labour Mayor, yes. Joe Anderson, who said, I'm not going to make any more cuts. Unfortunately, if you look into the fine detail, that claim gets a little bit spurious. There are councils like Salford, which are saying, we're not passing on any more cuts. Unfortunately, again, if you dig into the detail, that's not really true. They're but, making cuts this year. Yes. Joe Anderson's making cuts this year and saying he won't make any further cuts. But OK, you said it now. So all right then, come on, what are you actually going to do? But that's the point, isn't it? Because Sadiq Khan recently has said that he supports rent control in London. Mm, yeah. Now, the Socialist Party has been campaigning for rent control in London for nearly 10 years now. Yes. The point is, is what is he going to do yeah. to bring in rent control into London? And rather than saying, you know, like Joe Anderson said, well, we're not going to make cuts. But, you know, when you dig into the finer detail, it's just a delaying tactic. With the request for rent control... We can all say we support rent control, but what are you actually going to do mm. to bring in rent control? What is your, going to be your role, if you like, to bring that in as a policy for millions of people, particularly young people in London, who are desperate for London to be a rent-controlled city? I mean, the answer to that is nothing. It's going to do nothing. So let's talk a little bit more, actually, about housing policy in London then, because yeah. the housing crisis is a major Massive. issue. It's been yeah. a major issue Massive. in London for years and years and years and years. I know loads yeah. of people in my generation have been forced to move further and further out of the centre of town where they may work, even out of London altogether, into shoddy housing. It's a burning issue for the whole working class and big sections of the middle class now, actually outside London increasingly as well. So Deep Khan's got something called the London Plan, mm -hmm. which addresses housing. And he's also, as you said, Nancy, promised rent control. What sort of rent control is necessary? Because that could mean any number of different things, rent control. What is Khan's London plan? And what would a socialist plan for housing in London look like? I think that we should state what we think rents should be in London. So, for instance, in Walthamstow at Black Horse Road, there was a block built and it was supposed to be an affordable block. And the manager said to me that the two-bedroom flats there a 1,000, it's either 300 or 400, I can't remember, 1,300 pounds a month for a two bedroom flat. See, their perception of affordable rents is not the same mm. as the vast majority of people in London. The people who clean the streets, the people who empty the bins, 
the people who teach our kids, the people who look after our old people, their perception of what is affordable is not the same as oh. what working class people perceive. So I think we have to state £600 for a two bedroom flat, something like that, so that people can have an idea of what is possible with rent control, how that could change their lives if we implemented rent control. Now, <laughs> the London Labour Councils have introduced landlord licensing schemes. I mean, you could say that they're toothless tigers because they're very cosmetic. But if Sadiq Khan was to use his powers to say, right, we're going to recommend that the average London property is £600 for a two-bedroom flat a month, and that we're now going to campaign to make that a reality, then I think there would be resonance. That's something that we could argue for, that we could say that at least you've got to come out openly and state a figure on what you think is acceptable, that you should use your powers in the GLA to implement that as far as possible in the properties that you own and that you control, that all land that is owned by the GLA, TfL, etc., that only council housing or social housing on genuinely affordable rents, i.e. the figure that I've just given, I suppose we could have some negotiations around that in different areas. But I think that the time has come now to state exactly what we want rents to be mm. in London and not just vaguely leave it open because... You know, the world and his wife can say they support rent control. Mm. Well, sometimes rent control could just mean a limit on how much it increases from a level which is already way too high, couldn't it? And, and I that's think what that, Miliband talked about. Yeah, no, control, exactly, exactly. That's yeah. So it can, it means anything to anybody, and sometimes it's been talked about in terms of setting a cap according to a certain relationship to the average income of an area. But I'm not sure you can do something like that in London, where the income, the average income in London is distorted by the extremely rich people yeah. <laughs> that live in London yeah. and doesn't reflect what the majority of people actually have to live on. And there's even an issue, because normally we would say, use the phrase like social rent, meaning you know the kind of rents that people are used to paying in council houses. But there's even an issue about that now, mm where some people have been assessed as being too poor to even be able to afford a social rent. Mm. So where they're meant to live, you know, it's, it's entrenching homelessness, mm. which is obviously a massive problem. Homelessness is a massive problem. And that's the thing with Sadiq Khan's London plan, because there's all those features like you've described, James, of people being forced out, families being forced out. I think it's 100,000 families that have been forced out of London through this process for social cleansing and that's because they can't afford it it also is to do with these demolitions and the regeneration projects you know supposed regeneration who doesn't want regeneration but actually it's gentrification it's forcing mm. people out of their homes but as well as people being moved out of london there's increased street homelessness mm. i mean you know we literally you'll meet three four people on the streets in just changing tubes you know yeah. it's a terrible terrible situation and increased deaths on the streets and everything and Sadiq Khan's solution to that the London plan that you just asked about well Nancy's the expert on all of this but that is building up blocks of flats expensive flats small flats though mm. not not luxury but expensive way beyond what most people can afford in all the transport hubs and all the town centres so scarring the town centres building up these huge tower blocks, and people can't live in them. The people who are in housing need can't live in them. And most of the time, I don't think in every instance, but the vast majority of the time, it's handing public land over to private property developers, and they're the only ones who yeah. make anything out of it. And also, I think that the thing is about the London plan is I didn't realise until the model, like a giant octopus, sort of grabbed in the whole of London yeah. as it spread... <laughs> But the London plan, in a way, it still comes back to the idea of councils not fighting yeah. for more money, for better yeah. settlement. Because the model of build them high and pack them in 
is a way of raising council tax. I mean, we haven't covered council tax, mm. but it's the Labour councillors in London mm. taking fright at never-ending austerity mm -hmm. and the shutting off of the local government grant in 2020. So, in a way, the model that they've used since 2010 onwards in London and around the country is the idea is if we have mass densification of housing what we will have is we'll have council tax on tap which mm. we can raise and the business rates and the business rates mm. as a form of revenue to be self financing in mm. a way instead of going from what we had after the last war which is a settlement which obviously it wasn't perfect, but it was an attempt to distribute funds for public services across the country. Now, regions technically could be pitted against regions on the basis of how many people they attract to these high-density you know, housing projects. And I was at a meeting last night, as I said, hundreds of people at it. And the point about this model, first of all, it will not solve the housing crisis. In fact, it's compounding the housing crisis because it is giving previous mm. public land, closed or public services like libraries, police stations, fire stations, you know, adoption services. I've seen them all around Walthamstow. They all close and then they're regenerated as these new flats. So what you've got, almost like San Paolo, you've got like the development of high-density housing with no amenities. Mm -hmm. There are people standing up at this meeting saying, we've got 10,000 people coming in. We haven't got a doctors. We were promised the doctors. The doctors up the road are closed with 13,000 people on the books. So not only have we not got a doctors, up the road ain't got a doctors. The only doctor surgery in the area has got a four-week waiting list. Then there was a discussion about the schools, they're not planning to build any more schools. Mm. So it's a, a model which doesn't deal with the whole question of amenities, but at the same time, as this model has spread out from central London to outer London, the housing crisis has got worse. So it doesn't even tick the boxes on its own remit. Mm. It compounds the problem. It's just simple displacement. And that's why we're calling for a generalised objection to the London plan. We're standing explicitly on reject the London plan. But obviously, we would call for a socialist plan. So what would that look like? Well, first of all, we wouldn't <laughs> impose it on communities. <laughs> we wouldn't impose it. It would be a discussion around what is needed. And obviously, we would be fighting, we would fight for more money for local services. I mean, in Liverpool... Mm -hmm. I don't remember off the top of my head, but it's 5,000 council homes. Mm -hmm. It's 1,000 jobs for young people. I think how many full-time jobs, I don't remember. Nurseries. Mm -hmm. Parks, Reorganisation of the schools. Yeah. So the this was in the 80s. In the 80s, the yeah. So the meeting I was at last night, if that was a discussion around a socialist plan and the councillors broke the meeting down into these breakout tables and people had to talk about what they wanted. And exactly what they wanted is what we delivered in Liverpool. Mm. People wanted a little park where they could take their kids mm. and have a cup of coffee. There were women in the room saying there are no playgroups in this area. It's a desert and with 10,000 extra people, mm. where, what are we going to do? Mm. There was, you know, discussions about all these amenities that make life nice. Mm. And... I mean, an interesting point that's raised around the London plan is often you get like these, you know, trendy hubs of nice cafes and a climbing wall and a nice artisan bakery. But what came up last night is there's nothing free. Mm. So the libraries have closed. They're mm. free. The youth clubs have gone. They're mm. free. The swimming pools have been privatised. You know, they were cheap. Mm. So... It's a privatised model. It's a privatised model that is not working for working class people. And I think mm. that, that that's the essence of our objection, putting forward the idea of a socialist plan for London. Mm. Mm. So you'd be talking about building council houses, building 
council owned and publicly funded and operated amenities proportionate to what was actually needed in the area and doing all of these things on the basis of social rents, so bringing in caps rather than simply controls on the increases in the private sector and on the basis of actually delivering what people in the area wanted and needed mm. by asking them. Yeah, and secure tenancies as well, you yes. have to add that in there as well, yeah. Fire safety as well, isn't it? You have to take that into account. But, I mean, can you imagine the difference that if there was that collective approach and democratic approach and discussion about how to spend public money and building public housing like that, that you'd have had atrocities like what happened at Grenfell Mm. and all these private companies all passing the buck, essentially being let off the hook over, you know, mass murder, effectively... If you had like a publicly owned and controlled process that was democratic and transparent, then, you know, you'd avoid all those sorts of issues as well. And obviously part of our housing manifesto is just basic things like we demand the removal of all the cladding straight away, review all the new building projects, a moratorium on all the new building projects until they're all properly assessed in terms of fire safety, and that links to the densification points that Nancy was making as well. So let's move on from the housing crisis then to low pay, and this is one of the issues which has come up as part of the strike wave which we discussed earlier. What should a living wage be in London? £15. £15 an hour. We stand on £15 an hour. And what's Sadiq Khan saying about that? Well, he he is a supporter of the London Living Wage and the GLA is a London Living Wage employer. Well, the GLA decides what the London Living Wage is, doesn't it, as well? And it goes up each year, but it's going up to, I've forgotten the figure, £10.80 something this year in April. But you can't live on that. You and, can't live on that in London. And also, the thing is, so many of the people that make London work are outsourced workers, yeah. people who've been privatised, like the cleaners at the Foreign Office at the moment. Mm. So many of the really low-paid workers are people who 20 years ago would have been public sector workers involved in national pay bargaining, you know, and on decent wages for London, mm. if you included London waiting, etc. Mm. And the deregulation and privatisation in a way, makes a nonsense even of a London living wage, let alone the fact that, you know, Sadiq Khan might nominally support a living wage because behind the scenes, people are being paid a lot worse than that and it's legitimised, it's legal, Mm. because they're outsourced workers. So one of our primary demands is for all outsourced workers to be brought back in-house. Yeah, that's right. And you'd have to link to pay, obviously, the contracts as well and enter the zero-hour contracts. The other thing that we mentioned earlier, as a growing social problem, there's a great deal of anxiety about this in London, particularly among people in working-class areas with children, is the scourge of knife crime. Yes. And connected to that, the question of any kind of future whatsoever for young people, and this is of course a national, in fact an international question, but particularly related to violence in London. What is Sadiq Khan saying about that and what would be a socialist response to this crisis? Well, Sadiq Khan says a lot about knife crime and doesn't really say a lot either. I mean, some of his more recent comments were basically... Yes, it's terrible and it's going to take us years to rectify the problem. Apart from saying that he wants more police for London and he wants everybody's council tax to go up by 40 quid to pay for more police. But, you know, the Socialist Party 10 years ago, when austerity started to bite, we were campaigning in the communities in London to stop the closure of the youth clubs. I mean, I myself was on the steps of Waltham Forest Town Hall in the very first wave of cuts that took place against the career service, against the youth service, and people who worked drugs outreach workers, etc., people who worked in the youth offending team. We were the people who were saying, do not cut these services. It's a false economy. It's going to come back to bite you, the fact that 
these very, very intimate services, if you like, these very, very vulnerable people who have these tailored services to help them. If you cut them, then you are basically abandoning those people. And that is exactly what has happened. Young people, vulnerable young people have been left. And I mean, we call for all the reopening of the youth clubs. Mm. We call for the restoration of educational maintenance allowance, which is mm. EMA, which would basically pay young people a, a mm. subsidy, not nearly enough, but a subsidy to keep them in education, mm. to call for the reopening of the career service. I mean, the career service in Walthamstow now has been given over to, you've guessed it, private flats. Mm -hmm. And we call for, you know, just a massive injection of funds to help young people. I mean, in London, I remember... The youth clubs, I mean, I didn't really go to a youth club, but a lot of my friends did go to a youth club. And the thing is, is it's not just that you had dedicated youth workers for very vulnerable young people. You also had things like over the six weeks holidays when people maybe could drift. There were programmes that you could go to. Now, all that has virtually gone. Mm -hmm. And just on, the, on another point, why is it so bad in London? Why has knife crime in other areas of the country gone down but in London it seems to be going up and I do think a factor in that is the huge chasm between the rich and the poor that has developed that there's a sense of you can live in one community and not even be conscious of another community living alongside you mm -hmm. and that does go back to the way that London has developed in the last 10 years the fact that there isn't access to libraries council housing etc for people people don't feel like young a lot of young people feel like they don't have a chance and yet they see all this money around them and they're vulnerable and i think that we would address those problems with socialist policies as i just outlined but it is an absolute condemnation of khan that he has come to basically accept that that's a feature of london life it never was mm. and it doesn't have to be mm. So this is a question of restoring youth services, restoring council services, providing more amenities like we talked about earlier, but also providing support to stay in education and at the end of it, providing jobs. Job. Yeah, That's jobs, the thing, yeah. you can restore the career service, but I remember I didn't grow up in London, yeah. but when I left school at 17 and I went to Connections, the career service yeah. at the time, and I said, look, I've seen the adverts, I would like to train to be an electrician, thanks very much. And they said, oh, yeah. I know you've seen the adverts, the reality is that's bluster from the government, there are no apprenticeships, and yeah. so I left, and that was yeah. the end of that. And yeah. I didn't become an electrician. Anyway, that's not the point. The but point you is you've what? got to have stuff to back that's up. That's right, and the thing is, I worked as a Saturday worker in a library, we had Saturday jobs working in a library. They were well-paid jobs. They were nine till five jobs. And if you were in school, you could get six-week jobs. Over the six weeks holidays, mm. you could get a job over the six weeks holidays. Mm. Now, those jobs, because of weekend work, have been integrated into the contracts. So Saturday jobs are harder to get. Mm. Holiday jobs are harder to get. Mm. And so what chance do young people have? They've basically excluded a layer of people from having access to a sense that they can be their own people and get a job, get a flat. I mean, when I left school in London in the 1980s, it was still possible to get a little council flat as a young person. I'm talking about 17, 18, you could get a flat. Mm. You could get housing benefit mm. to pay for that flat and you could do A-levels. So mm. basically, you were helped out. If you didn't have a rich mummy and daddy, you were helped out. Mm. Now those people are not helped. None of those things exist. None no, of those things exist. Right. Well, they existed in London. And that's how they've integrated all these policies, aren't they? Because that's about housing policies as well. Yeah, it's, all, yeah. it's all tied together, housing benefit, the whole lot. One final question then. What could a socialist mayor do about the environment? Talking about young people, yeah. fighting for a future. I think we've sort of answered it in the London plan, haven't we? We've talked about the model, the privatised model that she's... Yeah. I mean, I've talked a bit much, Jules, I say. All the points that we've made so far are all part of that question, aren't they? And that's about the, the lived environment, what you actually live in. It's linked to the policies we've raised about transport, because part of our policies about London transport is that it should all be 
all the sections of it that have been privatised, which is the buses, obviously, in particular, should be brought back in-house. That's just happening about the Woolwich ferries, apparently, so that's an example that it can be done, and we'd argue that that should be done overall so that then you get a fully funded, publicly owned, democratically planned public transport system. But there's also issues about punitive measures, aren't there? Sadiq Khan likes to punish us punish people. instead of actually creating an environment where it's possible to cut down on pollution. So we'd argue for investment in non-diesel public transport and mm. something like a grant so that people could replace their polluting cars or or convert them instead of more taxes, <laughs> which is what the actual plans are. More taxes on ordinary people, though. That yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. we don't mind more taxes on the rich, but it's, <laughs> it's not the rich who's got the old bangers, is it? That's right. So, you know, rather than taking a punitive approach, we think that it should be those sorts of active measures that could tackle air pollution in London, which does have to be tackled. Yeah, I mean, in our area, they've introduced a cycling scheme. Yeah. They've got £18 million from Transport for London. And this is important, isn't it? Because it's not just about the effects on the global climate, but it's actually about respiratory problems for yeah. people who live yeah. in London. Yeah. I mean, I'm asthmatic. Yeah. I'm asthmatic. Yeah. And at this meeting last night, everybody was saying we're bottom of the league in the area in terms of air quality. So it's a real... So how has the cycling scheme impacted that? Well, this is what I was going to say. I mean, we're the Socialist Party. If you want to see how illogical capitalism is, then just survey London at certain times. Because... The cycling scheme, it's a bit like banning polluting cars from London. On the surface, you know, you can go for it. That's a good idea, you know. This is what we need, cleaner air, everyone cycling, etc. But because the organisation of London is based on capitalist economics and somebody has to make a profit somewhere along the line, you know, at this meeting last night, one of the big issues was the fact that since the cycling scheme has been introduced, we've lost a bus route. Mm. and loads of people, disabled people, people with kids, etc., were saying, we can't get on our bike, we need our bus route. Mm. But Sadiq Khan said there's a number of buses that are just sitting empty, mm. not making any money, mm. so therefore they cut the bus route. And because a lot of the good jobs have gone from the area, I mean, I lost a good job in my own area, mm. people have to travel. So therefore... They've taken up one of the lanes for the cyclists into the main roads around the area, and now we are traffic logged. So there's a big issue now about how polluted we are mm. because of stationary vehicles mm. all sitting there because people have to travel to get to work. And so the whole thing about the environment raises the need for socialism and a sort of logical plan. So subsidised buses... Keeping the jobs local. I mean, if you look at Dagenham in the 1970s, if you ever look at old footage, everybody's cycling in because they all lived locally mm. and they could cycle in. No one able to get told, you know, get off your lardy arse and you know, get on your bike and find a job. That's basically what accompanies a lot of these so-called environmental schemes and they're creating a backlash. And it is dangerous because... I mean, what we've been saying is that you can have thousands of people campaigning against the environment, like in Australia, thousands and thousands of young people objecting to climate change. But then when the Conservatives, the Liberals there, used the question of jobs, they got voted in, mm. the lack of jobs. Trump in America, going on about the miners, he used the cards of jobs. So we can't allow in London these punitive green taxes and green punitive schemes to create a sort of populist right-wing backlash, which does exist. It does exist in working-class communities. Why are we being taxed? Why are we being forced off the buses? You know, there is that consciousness. That's so it, it raises the whole question of logical socialist planning. Mm, that's right. People talk about a Green New Deal. That's the common thing that's been talked about now. But that's why we say it has to be socialist. It has to be a socialist Green New Deal, because in the end it has to be about public ownership, about democratic control, working class control and management. It has to be about nationalisation, and we fight for that 
and would, if there were socialists in City Hall, if there was a socialist London mayor, then they would fight to use all their powers to the maximum to achieve as much of that as possible in London, but also use the position to help build a mass movement nationally that could challenge the Tories and that could fight for socialist policies. It was a governmental programme, because that's in the end, that's what we're fighting for. We want to use this campaign to assist the debate and to assist building a mass movement that can then fight for a socialist government that would take all of the main aspects of the banks and big business into democratic public ownership. And that's how you can properly then plan society so that we tackle the environment and housing and transport and all of these issues in the interest of the overwhelming majority of us. Thanks very much, Paula. Thanks very much, Nancy. Well, I want to say something else. Go, Go on. ahead. Which is that, if you're listening to this and you are interested in it... <laughs> yes. <laughs> ..and you agree and you want to find out more about the socialist policies that we're fighting for in London, as Nancy often says, it's a rich man's game yeah. to stand candidates in the London elections... The smallest amount of money you need is a £1,000. The elections are for the mayor, which is directly elected, and for a London Assembly, which is made up of 25 Assembly members, some of whom are directly elected in constituency seats, and I think there's 14 of those. They're big constituencies, two or three boroughs a time. And then there is also a top-up list. Now, to stand for a constituency candidate costs a £1,000, to stand a list costs five thousand pounds. If you fancy being mayor, you need to find twenty, yeah, because yeah. it's ten thousand to stand and ten thousand to appear in the booklet. Which explains why Rory Stewart's standing. Yeah, there. that's right. So he's the ex-Tory yeah. who's uh, run this gimmick of I'll, I'll come, invite me around your house, I'll come sleep on your floor to find out about yeah. your borough. That's right. So obviously the London elections aren't that far away now, and we want to raise money just to fight as much as we can. Whether that's standing candidates or just fighting for the programme, we'll do as much as we can, depending on how much we can raise. So people need to go to the London Socialist Party website, which is londonsocialistparty.org.uk, and there is a button to press to donate money to help the fight for socialist policies in London. Great. Thank you, Paula. Anything else, Nancy? Thank you, James. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. <laughs> Socialism is produced by the Socialist Party, the England and Wales section of the Committee for Workers International. This week, we heard from Nancy Taff and Paula Mitchell, speaking to James Ivans, and I'm Scott Jones. You can read more about the Socialist Inter City Hall campaign at London Socialist Party's website, londonsocialistparty.org.uk. And you can read more about this campaign and other episodes in the episode notes at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash podcasts. If you agree with the policies and actions the Socialist Party is fighting for, we need you. Join our campaign to build a truly effective working class fighting force in the trade union and labour movement. Join the Socialist Party now. Send us your details at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash join. And if you live outside England and Wales but want to join the fight for socialism in your country, contact the Committee for Workers International by visiting socialistworld.net. Help us spread the word by giving us a five-star review and subscribing so you don't miss out. Don't forget to recommend us to your co-workers and friends. We want you to send us recordings from picket lines and campaigns and reports of your activity. We want your questions, comments and ideas for future episodes. Email socialismpodcast at socialistparty.org.uk Socialism the podcast has no wealthy backers. We survive thanks to the financial support of ordinary working class and young people and we're proud of the political independence that gives us. If you like what you hear, help us take the fight to big business. You can make a regular donation or a one-off payment at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash donate. Until next time, solidarity.